Welcome back to Open Line. If you are just joining us tonight, our guest is Dr. David Aronoff, Director of Infectious Diseases at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, answering your COVID questions, whether it be about the virus or the vaccine or something else. Go ahead and give us a call. The lines are open. 615-737-PLUS is the number to call. Doctor, thank you again for being with us tonight. A question that I've seen circulating a lot on social media just in the past week or two is, hey, whatever happened to the flu? You Usually we're panicking about the flu right now. Uh, so what is the story of the flu this year? Yeah, Carrie, that's a really important question. A couple things. First of all, we learned from the Southern Hemisphere. Remember that in the Southern Hemisphere, our summer is their winter mm -hmm. and their winter is our summer. So they hit their flu season uh, when we were in the summer. They were also dealing with COVID-19. And what we saw was reduced flu activity which we think and is likely due to the fact that people were trying to prevent the spread of COVID-19 by socially distancing and wearing masks and taking good care of hand hygiene. So we thought that if we could get people immunized against influenza and get people wearing face coverings and socially distancing and doing hand hygiene, that one of the benefits in addition to preventing the spread of COVID-19 is we might see less influenza this year. So first of all, the uptake of flu vaccines has been better this year than in years past, particularly in adults. That's really great. The other thing is that flu activity is down this year right now compared to this season last year and the year before. And we think that that has to do with not only vaccination, but the fact that we're staying apart, we're wearing our face coverings, we're staying inside when we're feeling sick, we're going to get evaluated when we don't feel well, we're keeping our hands clean. All of those things have lots of benefits. In fact, one of the things that may come out of this pandemic is that every cold and flu season, we might see better uptake of vaccines and we may see people staying home when they don't feel well and not feeling like they need to go to work and tough it out when they're not feeling well. And all of that may translate into reduced flu activity year over year. That's a great explanation. I do wanna ask you about the flu vaccine versus the COVID-19 vaccine. Every year when we look back at the flu season, we say, oh, the flu vaccine was about 30 to 40% effective this year. And then all of a sudden we have this COVID-19 vaccine and it's 90 to 95% effective. How can that be? Yeah, I mean, part of it is just the way that the vaccines work. Remember that the COVID vaccine uh, uses a new technology called mRNA technology, and it gives a very, very strong immune response to the spike protein on the outside of the virus. And it seems to be just the perfect vaccine target. It's working better than expected. And even though we've heard and we've talked about some of the changing genetics or gene mm -hmm. sequence of the virus right now, it doesn't seem, at least we don't have evidence yet, that it's escaping our immune system. That's different with influenza. Influenza also mutates a little bit every season and we see different strains of influenza circulating and we try to match the vaccine to those strains, but it's a challenge every year. And so uh, part of why the flu vaccine isn't always perfect is first of all, it, it, it may not be quite as good of a vaccine against the flu as the coronavirus vaccine is against the coronavirus, but also we're up against different strains and trying to match the strains, which isn't right now a challenge with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So that's, that's part of it. Um, I'm sure we'll learn more as time goes by as we get more people immunized with the COVID vaccine to see just in the real world, is it still 95% effective? You mentioned mRNA. This is something new to most of our vocabularies. Is it possible in layman's terms to describe how this vaccine was developed and how it works? Oh, absolutely. So first of all, Let's think about our own body. The cells in our body have something called a nucleus inside our cell that holds our chromosomes, which are made of DNA. That's our genetic material. And for that DNA to be used, we, our body and our cells, turn that into RNA, which is a very short-lived molecule, which instructs our cells to make things like proteins, the building blocks of new cells and the workhorses of our body. The virus is much simpler. The virus is basically a shell that's made out of protein and a little bit of fatty molecule. And inside that shell is a single strand, not of DNA, but of that 
RNA. And when the virus gets into our own cells, when the spike proteins like Velcro stick to our cells, the virus gets inside, the shell cracks open, that RNA gets into our cells, our own cells pick that up and they know what to do with RNA. They make it into protein because that's what our body does with our own RNA. But that protein is, that RNA is telling it to make new virus proteins. So basically when the virus gets inside of our cell, it turns that cell into a factory that just uses that RNA to make more and more and more viruses until essentially that cell pops, it explodes and dies, and the virus goes on to neighboring cells and so on and so on, and that's how it makes us sick. So uh, what the vaccine manufacturers did, which was brilliant, was to just take the piece of the RNA from the virus that doesn't encode the whole virus, it doesn't tell a cell to make the whole virus, but it just gives the instructions to a cell to make the spiky protein on the outside, the part that's like the Velcro for the virus to stick to our cells. That little piece of RNA is not actually obtained from virus. We make it, we synthesize it in the lab. Pfizer's making it in the lab, Moderna's making it in the lab. They put it into a little package called a nanoparticle that protects that RNA so that it doesn't degrade. When we get that into our muscle, that RNA goes into our muscle cell, it gets made into a spike protein, not a virus, not a whole virus, just the little spiky protein bit. That muscle cell then shows that spike protein to our immune system, which then says, wait, that's not us, that's foreign. And we mount an immune response. And then we're armed and ready. If the actual virus were to come into our respiratory system, our immune system has now seen that spike protein before it's made antibodies against it, and it can now block that virus from causing infection. Why is this, I guess, why is this the first time we're doing a vaccine like this? Well, it's interesting. Um, the, the idea that we could use mRNA technology to make a vaccine was not believed for many, many years, even though people were very interested in trying to do it and have developed that technology to try to use it as a vaccine against certain cancers and even other infectious diseases. But as science is, things move slowly. Mm -hmm. And as those uh, people developing mRNA vaccines for usual common infections were slowly plodding along, along comes a pandemic where everybody on earth says we need a vaccine and all of a sudden money is not a rate limiting issue uh, scientists are all pointed in the same direction and so people could take that existing idea that existing technology and say you know what this is the perfect instance where we need to accelerate the development of an mrna vaccine and let's just do it and so the reason that we were able to do this is that scientists had been funded by people like us taxpayers to understand things like how mrna works and how vaccines work and put us in a perfect position for the development of this i would just point out that the moderna vaccine itself uh was largely the development was largely spearheaded at the nih by a team led by a former vanderbilt employee really? uh vanderbilt scientist barney graham who now leads a vaccine institute at the nih and so um, so we have some uh, uh, so, some play in, in the development of this vaccine, in addition to the fact that Mark Dennison, uh, a coronavirus expert here, uh, really was the one that had the idea of using remdesivir as a treatment. So between treatments and vaccines, Vanderbilt has played a really important role in the fight against COVID-19. You know, that is exciting and what has probably been a very dark few months there in the hospital. And I do want to ask you just on a daily operations. I asked you earlier about how your day kind of revolves around COVID-19 patients and treating them. But just from a staffing position and daily operations of nurses and doctors, how are things different? Because on the news every day, we talk about ICU capacity and how many hospital beds there are. And is there going to be enough room? And, and really, that comes down to staff at hospitals. And, you know, what is the situation? But inside the hospital walls, what has changed, particularly in the last month? What do things look like? Well, there's a lot of teamwork and there's a lot of what I might call cross-pollination. So it's an all hands on deck approach and people who may have been working in a surgery unit, for example, may now be involved in helping to care for patients with COVID-19. Uh, we're seeing that in our intensive care units. Uh, we're seeing that in our regular hospital floors. What we're basically seeing is that this 
crisis has led to a lot of cooperation and teamwork. And, you know, I know that this is the case in hospitals all over the world, but it has been really so heartening to see people uh, just look around and say, how can I help? How can we help each other? And really lock arms and whether it's someone working in the emergency department uh, or a palliative care unit or a surgical ICU or an operating room, we're all asking how can we help. And so I think cross-pollination has been a really important part of making sure that we have enough people power to care for sick patients. And I know every family appreciates that when they're put in that position so very much. Okay, we're gonna take another quick break. It is your last chance to ask questions of Dr. Aronoff when we come back. So if you wanna get that question in, that dying, burning COVID question, now is the time to call uh, 615-737-PLUS.